You're listening to the For I Will Be With You podcast. For I Will Be With You. Daily Reflections on Recovery from the Bible. Welcome back to the For I Will Be With You podcast. My name is Baruch. I'm an alcoholic. I'll be your host. For this 13th week of the year, from March 25th to March 31st, going from Genesis 50:26 through Exodus 3:1. So we're at the very end of the book of Genesis. And it says in Genesis 50:26, So Joseph died, being 110 years old, and they embalmed him, and he was put in a coffin in Egypt. So this is the very end of the book of Genesis, it ends with the death of Joseph. And what's significant about this, partly, uh, and this is we're going to get a little bit into, into Jewish ritual uh, and its meaning in the Bible and recovery, is that this is when uh, in the in the synagogue the Torah scroll, the first five books of the Bible are read from a scroll out loud every week, and um, the, the, the Torah is divided into 50 uh, weekly sections and uh, this this section is the only section in the Torah where there is no space between the end of this section and the beginning of the next section which is the book of Exodus it's an interesting thing because usually there's a little gap like a, like a, a between two paragraphs if you could look at a Torah scroll and the so this is called the closed portion. It's the only quote-unquote closed portion in the Torah. And the question is, why? Why is it closed like this? And one explanation given is that once Joseph dies, it's the beginning of the process that will lead to the enslavement of the Israelites under Pharaoh in Egypt. And the Jacob's children, the family of Jacob, which had come down to Egypt during the famine, in their grief uh, over the death of Joseph, it's as if their hearts were also closed. And in recovery, what this brings to mind is how to deal with the death of people who were important to us, either in our own personal lives or in recovery. And I think the challenge is to is to um, is to maintain a, a focus on recovery and hope, hopefulness in the face of of grief. And as we've seen also in recovery, there's two kinds of death. There's actual death; people unfortunately die. They die of old age. They die of diseases they contracted during recovery or during their drinking and using. Um, and then people also re relapse and go out, which unfortunately can be a form of death and can certainly lead to death. And I know I personally have seen this a few times. Someone's there working a program, then they're not, and then they're dead. It's happened more times than I'd like to think about. Young people, people full of promise, all of a sudden they're dead. It's a griefing process. What can it do for our program? Hopefully we can stay focused, you know, or we have mentors in the program, elders, people with a lot of time, people who inspired us, and like everybody, they grow old and they pass on, and, um, you know, it can it can be disruptive to recovery, but I think one way to to approach it is to try and honor their memory through working a good program. So that's the end of the book of Genesis. So now we're going to go into Exodus. And Exodus 1 1 begins with the, Exodus 1 1 says, the beginning of Exodus says, Now these are the names of the sons of Israel who came into Egypt with Jacob. Every man came with his household. Now, Jacob and Israel is another name for Jacob, just so you know, right? So it's interesting. The book of Exodus begins with a list of names. It, the, 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 
the Bible then recites 70 names. And in fact, the, the name of the book of Exodus in Hebrew is Shemos, or names. It's the book of names. Um, <clears throat> and at this time, the the Israelite nation is, is free. They are free people, but they are in exile. They're not in their land anymore. They're in another land. And it's the beginning of a process where they'll have to endure centuries of slavery before being freed by Moses. And as addicts, maybe we can identify with this moment. This is the moment when you leave your other life, the life you had before you started drinking and using. And I think one thing which we can be reminded of by this verse is that we each have a name that that these that the there's a there's a temptation when you're thinking about the enslavement of the Israelites for so many hundreds of years that they were sort of a nameless anonymous mass of people but they weren't each of them had a name each person had a name and they certainly had names coming down into Egypt from the land of Israel and they never lost their names. They didn't lose their family identities, even though the Egyptians treated them uh, as slaves. And in meetings, I don't think it's an accident that we, when we introduce ourselves in a meeting, we say our names. We say, hi, I'm Baruch, I'm an alcoholic. You still have a name. It doesn't matter how far down you've gone um, <clears throat> in your Addictive, addictive, addictive acting out. You're still a person, and you still have a name. You still stand for something. And even if you're a slave to your addiction, you still have a name. You're still a person. And we should try and remember our names. Someone gave us a name. Someone, most likely, with a lot of hopes and prayers for us in our future. And so we have our names just as the Israelites had their names going down into Egypt. Now in Exodus 1.8, we begin a familiar and tragic story, which says, Exodus 1.8 says, Now there arose a new king over Egypt who knew not Joseph, the new Pharaoh. This is some time later. Although there's discussion in the commentary that maybe this is actually the same Pharaoh who Joseph worked for, but somehow now that he was dead, he just conveniently forgot who this person was, or it was a new a new leader, or there's even a theory that it was a, a totally different family, like a, a different dynasty that arose that maybe really didn't know who Joseph was, but they certainly didn't have any uh, respect for him and what he'd done, which seems strange because... Joseph really, not only did Joseph save the kingdom of Egypt and save everybody's life, he also vastly enriched Pharaoh. This is part of the Joseph story. I didn't talk about it so much in this podcast because I can't get into everything. But in the process of the famine, Joseph sold grain to everybody in exchange first for money, then for livestock, and then for their land. And basically through the process, he, he bought basically the entire land of Egypt for Pharaoh and all the Egyptians became serfs to Pharaoh. Pharaoh became, he was already probably the richest man in the world, but the even ultra more rich man, richest man in the world because of Joseph. And here we have a little while later, nobody can remember who this guy was. Well, who was Joseph? We don't know who he was. And um, to see the Israelites who were the descendants of Joseph and Joseph's father, Jacob, as just this sort of threatening group of foreigners you know who they you know uh, who they didn't owe any any loyalty to. It's very shocking, but maybe not surprising, because maybe we've been through this too in our lives of addiction. Maybe we've been both Pharaoh and Joseph. And uh, I know this can be true that when we're drinking and using, sometimes we forget. We conveniently forget the people who've contributed to our success and our well-being. Instead, we want to hang out with our new downwardly mobile companions. How many of us have had that experience? Like, hey, 
Forget our teachers, our parents, our mentors, our real friends. I hate them all. I don't even remember who they are. I want to go hang out with my useless drinking buddies because they like me and they understand me. You know, and maybe we've been uh, on the other side of that too, where people just forget about us. And I, I heard this recently at a meeting. A young man, quite a young man, only in his early 20s. He was such a severe alcoholic as a teenager. His family finally said to him, you know, unfortunately, you just have to do whatever you're going to do, and we just can't be bothered anymore. And it wasn't that they didn't care, but they just they just couldn't deal with it. They couldn't bail this kid out of jail every week and pay for all the damage he caused. And they saw that he was destroying himself completely, and they were like, you know, we're sorry. We're just going to have to let you go. That's tough love. And that's, in a way... It's a type of forgetting. So we've been on both sides of this. And we should take this as a reminder, too, that it's dangerous to place too much importance on the goodwill of other people to assure our recovery. Now, people will do a lot for you in recovery, but we have to do it for ourselves, too. And we have to remember that only God has ultimate power to help us in recovery. If we place our faith in God and pray for recovery then it will not matter if the people in our lives forget who we are. Exodus 2.1 begins the story of Moses. The book of Exodus very quickly gets into the story of Moses. It says, And there went a man of the house of Levi, and took to wife a daughter of Levi, and the woman conceived and bore a son. And when she saw him, that he was a goodly child, she hid him for three months. Now, why does the mother of Moses, whose name was Yochebed, why does Yochebed have to hide the baby? The reason is that Pharaoh has decreed that all Jewish boy babies must be killed because Pharaoh's astrologer has foreseen that a Jewish man, a baby born to the Jewish nation will r rise up and take the people, the Jewish people out of, Israel, out of Egypt and will basically overthrow Pharaoh. So his uh, very clever solution to this problem is simply to kill all the Jewish babies. It's terrible. So, but he has to, he has to be hidden. But <clears throat> one thing that's notable about this is the Bible goes out of its way to tell us that the father and mother of Moses were, quote, a man and a woman. So the person as great as Moses, it's tempting to think of his origins as being greater than human, to think of him as being superhuman. Yet, Moses is no more and no less than a man. He is a human being. He is an embodiment of how great we can become if we work on ourselves, and how we're still essentially human at the same time, with flaws and problems. We see that in the story of Moses. He's not perfect. Um, so he has this distinctly unremarkable birth. And this, I think, should be, we can find this encouraging, because we're human beings too. We're not superhuman. We're people working on ourselves. But with God's help, we can, you know, empower ourselves and drive our efforts further. Exodus 2.3 continues with the story of Yocheved, Moses' mother. It says, And when she could not longer hide him, she took for him an ark of bulrushes and daubed it with slime and with pitch, and she put the child therein and laid it in the reeds by the river's brink. So this, um, this it translation, this, the, the, um, the Bible sometimes translates that Moses' mother put him in a basket or a little boat or something, but the, the, the way the Hebrew word is translated is an ark. It's like Noah's ark. It's like sort of and which is, I think, fitting. Like it's this. This is kind of the future hope of the Israelite nation, um, the future of the Judeo-Christian tradition. Put him in this ark to save him from the this destructive force of Pharaoh's decree. The commentators, the sages who interpreted the Torah, um, associate this this verse with the phrase, "Many designs are in man's heart." but the counsel of God, only it will prevail. The story of Moses is nothing less than a sequence of miracles, all of which were run 
counter to the cruel decree of Pharaoh that all Jewish boys be killed. So what's what's very interesting to, to anybody who reads this really should be is that here's Pharaoh who's t very afraid. Obviously he's fearful enough that an Israelite boy will rise up and revolt against him. And he then proceeds to um, raise this child in his very own house. Because what happens is that the daughter of Pharaoh, the princess, goes down to the river and sees this little basket with the baby in it. And as we've seen the movie with Charlton Heston, of course, we've seen this scene where the basket washes up on the shore of the river and uh, the princess takes the baby Moses into the palace and raises him as a son. So here's Pharaoh, despite his intentions to kill all Jewish boys to prevent this one unknown child from rising up against him, he actually takes that child right into the palace and brings him up as his own son, or grandson in this case. And this is this idea. Many Pharaoh had many designs in his heart. Many evil designs. But God is in charge, even of Pharaoh. And only God will prevail. So God arranges for Pharaoh to be responsible for the upbringing and nurturing of the very person who's going to destroy him. And in recovery, we should remember that we too have designs in our heart, both good and bad, but they will only be realized as God sees fit. This is a difficult thing to get our heads around. When, we are, when we're in self-seeking, we think that we can do anything. And the truth is we can do almost anything we want if God is on our side and if we ask for God's help. But when we start to think that we're running the show and that our will and not God's is what counts, we're heading for trouble. So Moses grows up. And again, this is we've seen this in the movie with Charlton Heston. Moses goes out of the palace. He's a young man. Um, or a, it's hard to know how old he is, but he's, he's, certainly, he's not a child anymore. He's, a, you know, he's either a teenager or a young man goes out of the palace to see how the Israelites are living and what's like outside the palace. And he sees an Egyptian taskmaster beating a beating a Hebrew slave. And he it says he looks around Exodus two twelve, the Bible says, and he, Moses, and he looked this way and that, and when he saw there was no man, he smote the Egyptian and hid him in the sand. So Moses was so upset by this brutality. He looked around. He saw there was no man around, no one around. He killed the Egyptian and hid him in the sand. So there's two ways to interpret this verse. One is that literally there was no one else around, that he was somehow they were out in the middle of nowhere, came upon these two people, the taskmaster beating the Israelite slave, and he killed the taskmaster and hid him. The other interpretation is this this scene happened in public in broad daylight with plenty of people around but that the way to interpret it is that Moses looked around and there was no man in Hebrew it says literally lo ish no there was not a man around meaning potentially that there were plenty of people around and plenty of men around but nobody who was being a man about it there was nobody who was willing to be a man and stand up for the right thing to do people were afraid of the consequences of doing anything it's understandable it's also tragic but nobody was doing the right thing so Moses decided to be a man act like a man and take action and maybe this may seem familiar to us as addicts in our addictive lives we know the right thing to do but we're afraid to do it we're, we're, we don't want to confront bad behavior, including our own bad behavior, but other bad behavior of others. And I think that there's also, I think a lot of our stories have moments of shame and regret over incidents that we could have acted differently in or things we could have done uh, that, we, that we were afraid to do or we got intimidated by people or, uh, you know, power, the power of others. 
we need to remember that only God has the power in life and God wants us to be a man or be a woman in the adult sense and put ourselves into right action so unfortunately or fortunately uh, depending on how you see the story Moses um, gets in trouble for killing this person and he runs away and um, he uh, goes to a place called Midian which people think may be in present day where present day Saudi Arabia is it's an area it's a Middle Eastern country kind of near Egypt but he tries to get far away because Pharaoh wants to kill him now for committing this crime and he gets married to a woman named Zipporah and his father is Jethro who's the priest of Midian He's also a character in the Beverly Hillbillies, but we won't talk about that. So it says in Exodus 3, 1, it says, Now Moses was keeping the flock of Jethro, his father-in-law, the priest of Midian, and he led the flock to the farthest end of the wilderness and came to the mountain of God unto Horeb. This is a, a wonderful, it's one of my favorite moments in the, in the Bible. Here's Moses, and one thing that's interesting just to note is that a lot of time has passed, according to the commentary, because the, when Moses goes down to Pharaoh to tell Pharaoh to let my people go, he's 80 years old. So an entire lifetime has passed. He's much older now, um, and it's not really clear what he's been doing for all these years, but uh, there's lots of theories on that. But he's he's older, he's married, um, He's he's one idea is that he's a man of you know prophetic gifts and he he's seeking quiet and solitude so he he moves the flock and he pushes them out into the wilderness he wants to be in a quiet place and i think one interpretation of this is he had a sense that he was destined to hear an important message and and he had to go to a place that was quiet and this is something that I think we should pay attention to. That the world is a very noisy place. <clears throat> and for us to get right in our recovery, sometimes we need to find a quiet space. And that means a space that literally might be quiet, like not a lot of noise, or also just not a lot of psychic noise. Getting away from, you know, toxic people or difficult people, just getting away from distractions that can get in the way of our focus. Now, of course, the challenge then is we have to return to a noisy world. We can't, most of us can't remain in solitude forever. But there's a, there's an idea here that's important that we need to go. It may be helpful for some of us to find a special place to go, our own sort of mountain of God, so to speak. And this is supposed to be Mount Sinai. And this is where he would eventually, um, you know, see the burning bush and hear the word of God to tell him to go down to Pharaoh and free the Israelites. But I think that if for most of us, and I know for myself, if we want to hear the word of God or, you know, get input from, from, from uh, God in our lives, we may have to find a quiet place to do it. You've been listening to the For I Will Be With You podcast. Daily Reflections on Recovery from the Bible. www.foriwillbewithyou.com. you.com.